welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us either in person or via webinar for the Interactions of Society and the Environment Seminar Series. It's sponsored by the Department of Journalism and Technical Communication here at CSU, the National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Forest Service, and USGS. It's been going on for about uh, 10 years here in Fort Collins, and we recently started doing a webinar broadcast. We've kind of grown in the number of sponsors and folks that we have contributing. Um, my name is Kristen Leong. I'm the Human Dimensions Program Manager with the National Park Service, um, and I'm also one of the seminar sponsors. And each semester, we try to schedule a series of seminars aimed at timely issues connecting society and the environment. And the purpose of the series is to provide a forum to discuss societal involvement in natural resource policy and decisions. And the topics span a wide variety of issues and areas of expertise. And so this session is being recorded. Um, we have figured out a way to get that served up. It might take us a little while to do the closed captioning, but we will be having those available, hopefully, in the near future. Um, and today's speakers are visitors in town from um, Kansas State University and University of Utah, of Utah. We have Drs. Jeffrey Skibbins and Ryan Sharp from Kansas State, and Dr. Matt Brownlee from University of Utah. And they will be speaking on ensuring successful synergies for wildlife and visitor management, based on a lot of their experience in US and international um, parks and protected areas. And so before um, we get started with their talks, just one little note. You probably have seen it cycling on the screen for you folks who are not here in person. We'll take questions following the presentation. And if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the questions text box in the GoToWebinar window. And you can type it at any time, and we'll try to get to it after the um, presentations and sort of synthesize them. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to our speakers. So uh, I wanted to say thank you to Kirsten for inviting us here and, and, and having us be part of this seminar. Uh, my name is Jeff Skibbins. I'm in the Park Management and Conservation Program at Kansas State University. Um, and so what, what, uh, what Matt, Ryan, and I want to do today is basically kind of give you guys a, a nice overview of, of some of the main issues surrounding uh, wildlife and, and ways to get people involved in conservation for wildlife and how that pertains to uh, park management issues in particular. And so uh, I'm going to leave off with some of the 30,000-foot the perspective, and then we're going to kind of circle down with, with Matt's presentation about some specific actions in a specific site, and then Ryan will bring it home with, with some uh, the way it plays out in reality uh, in some of our parks and how sometimes when things don't go the way you want them to, uh, how, that, how that's all going to work. So uh, let's see here. Well, I'm going to page down. Does that work? Okay. So um, broadly speaking, what we're going to talk about to begin with is, is the use of flagship species and how flagships can be used to improve conservation efforts. Basically, if you remember nothing else from this talk, and hopefully you may, but you may not, three keys to flagships are they're intentional, not accidental. You select them on purpose. Any species can be a flagship. So that charming little squirrel over there could be a flagship if you wanted it to be. And emotional connections to the animal are what drive the whole process. So that's my talk. I'm just going to go on now for a few more minutes with nice pictures, but that's, you know, that's the highlights. That will be on the text. If you're ready, you know, beginning of the semester, that's every student's question, right? So the big question, though, in, in, uh, in, in case you don't know, is, is um, so what is a flagship and, and why do I want one more particularly, especially if you're a, a site manager? Uh, what, are, what are the benefits of these things? It's important to remember that when we're talking about flagship species, they're a public campaign tool used to improve conservation. They are synonymous with the surrogate species concepts of keystone in, uh, keystones and indicators. They may be those as well, but they don't have to be. And if they don't deliver any ecological benefits, like a keystone or indicator is, that's cool because they're not supposed to. It's all social. We were talking to Kirsten earlier. If you, the question is, how do I know if I have a social problem? Well, if it deals with wildlife, a flagship will solve your problem. <laughs> it's a one-stop, one-size-fits-all. Um, they, 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 they're meant to produce publicly deliverable outcomes, not ecological outcomes. Okay? It's a bonus if they do, but don't worry if they don't. Any species is a potential flagship. Historically, we've relied on the big megafauna, but we're, we're learning more and more as, as more and more people are coming to the parks and getting more excited about wildlife, we're finding that uh, anything can really be a flagship, again, if you're intentional about it, if you select it on purpose and use it in a way to deliver conservation outcomes. And so success for flagships is defined by 
two main outcomes. You're going to raise awareness of an issue, and you're hopefully going to generate some action for that issue from the public or from your visitors or from your constituency and stakeholders. So very simply, um, it, you, you take a species, you add awareness and action, and you got a flagship species. That's, that's all there is to it, as, as simple as that. So how do they work? How does this all come about? As I mentioned, traditionally, we've relied on charismatic megafauna, save the whale, save the panda. Uh, we get people excited about something warm, fuzzy, cuddly, and they want to do something to save it. And the reason this has worked in the past, even though this may have been somewhat intentional, it was not the way we really envisioned flagships. Those are more of a marketing campaign as opposed to a conservation campaign. But what we're finding is that charismatic features in an animal, whichever, whatever they may be, are known to produce an emotional response in visitors, and that emotional response is what tends to drive behaviors. So some of the more recent studies that are coming out, in particular, this was done in some of the zoos, because uh, you have a much wider assortment of wildlife there in, in, in one shop. Um, when visitors express a, a, that they felt a connection to an animal, there's a strong uh, likelihood that they want to act to save that animal. So they'll donate money. They'll become a member of the organization. They'll sign up for listservs. They'll become politically active. Um, all of those are good outcomes that we can have. And again, it all comes back to the fact that when they have that connection, because of a charismatic feature, they're likely to act. So we link a charismatic animal. Again, easy pickings are the big ones to a conservation campaign, and we hope to get uh, public support from that. And so when we look at what some, again, traditional conservation campaigns are, we see um, poaching is, is a big one. Climate change, there's a big paper that just came out on using polar bears um, for, for global climate change initiatives through zoos and in some of the, uh, the tourism aspects up in Canada. Uh, we can use habitat loss. One of the projects I work on in Australia is with orangutans and uh, the palm oil campaigns and how to uh, prevent further habitat loss. And everybody can get very uh, supportive and excited about orangutans, and so they're a good um, flagship species for that. But we can also bring it back home a little bit more locally as, as management concerns at parks for both visitor management and resource protection. Again, what is the outcome that you're looking for? Let's find the animal that, that best represents that issue, and, and, and then they'll start building a, a communications campaign around that. So who can be a flagship? The easiest way is find something with broad, charismatic appeal. Um, generally, they're very large for the type of animal they are. Cute and cuddly. Right? We want something that you can send home with your kid from the gift shop as a keepsake. It's a souvenir from when you were there. You send it home to wherever. Uh, you bring it with you, and it, it works great. And, and one of the newer things, and, and again, this is one where we sometimes, with um, the traditional biology side of things, this gets people's hair up, but we want to anthropomorphize these animals. It's highly effective if you do it in an interpretive way that is based in science, of course. But the more anthropomorphic you can make the animal, the more likely it is to resonate with a wider section of the public. So go ahead, anthropomorphize. So these are then the charismatic megafauna. But what we're seeing is that more and more species are emerging as potential successful candidates for flagship status. Birds, reptiles, lichens, plants. Right? What's one of the biggest things at the Alpine Visitor Center in Rocky Mountain National Park? Why don't we want people walking out there? Right? This, this could be a flagship species. It might be harder to sell in the gift shop, <laughs> but it is, what it, it is an actual legitimate flagship, and they're using it in that way. So the benefits of doing this for your visitors, generally using flagships to, to anchor your management decisions, your policy decisions, and the visitor experience is going to produce increased satisfaction, understanding, concern, and awareness within your visitors. All those have been supported in the literature as being increased when people get involved with charismatic megafauna and a wildlife tourism experience. For you yourself at the site, you're generally going to see increases in, in finances, awareness, volunteering, and political activism because people know they can see the animal at your site. So they come there. They talk about it. It gets more press. It's simple publicity, but it works. It's effective. And when we look at then what are, so, so those are not necessarily conservation outcomes, but more management objectives, which are met. But when we look then at how are we going to actually help these animals, what we're finding is that Increase in visitation, the support networks are much stronger when you have flagships present and you're using them. 
and you also then have overall a greater degree of conservation success beyond just the flagship, but for all the all the issues on your site. So that you know it's a it's a rising tide raising all ships in that sense. But everything is not all rosy and coming out as we always want. One of the challenges is that oftentimes popularity is mistaken as a flagship response. Everybody comes to see the elk, the bears, the whales, whatever the case may be. But just because it's popular and people want to do it as a tourist attraction doesn't mean it's a flagship. Because what is your conservation goal? You link to that. If you don't have one, it's a tourist attraction, not a flagship. And oftentimes, though, we mistakenly think, oh, our visitation's up, our finances are up, we're getting more gate revenue. Must be because we have flagships. No, you've got popular animals, not flagships necessarily. The other problem is that the animals that we all know are most in need of conservation are not attractive, the public doesn't care about, and there's no way in the world you're going to get large sections of the public via CNN websites and broadcasts to get excited about the animals that most need our conservation status. So it, it can sometimes be a double-edged sword using these flagships because we resort to using the large megafauna and we, we forget the fact that these small passerine birds and these neotropical migrants really need our protection, but nobody's going to really get excited about a small little sparrow. Right? So it, it, it's a challenge to us then is how to, how to engage that. Also, there's a, a tendency to skew management policies towards these large animals, towards the popular tourist attractions, often at the expense of other policies, management issues, visitor resources, and, and the whole nine yards that go along with managing a park like that. So, they, and, it, and it's because they're so popular, we need to account for it. We need to have visitor management protocols in place because of road jams, traffic jams because of a bear sighting, and, and we have to devote all of our resources to managing for that, and so other things get left on the table and not funded or not managed appropriately. They always carry higher management costs, and one of the ones that's really starting to come out now that people are really starting to get a good handle on is this one, and this is a really insidious problem with flagships, is if you don't have one, nobody cares about you. Why would I go to your site? Why would I care about your conservation issue? And so if there's an inherent bias publicly for tourism and the general public against sites that don't have it because they're not as exciting, they're not as sexy, no one wants to go. So the challenge is to find ways then to engage publics in other ways if you don't have a flagship. But I would say you probably do, you just got to use it better. So what we're seeing now emerging as some alternatives is engaging a wider array of species as potential flagships and ways to demonstrate the role of our agency, our site, our conservation issue for what people are really trying to accomplish. And so we see new species emerging here, the non-traditional charismatic megafauna. We have really ugly little guys, right? Now that, that, this, this insect was actually about that long. I took that picture down in Florida. But um, you know, that's not something you first think of going to a, going to a park to see. Um, and what are some other outcomes that we can begin exploring? Matt's going to, going to talk about philanthropy a lot because that's one of the main ones. But if we put our heads to it, what else do we really want the public to do to help us with conservation? There's got to be more things out there than just giving money. So what are some other outcomes that we can begin delivering and searching for to, to improve flagship use? So how do we build a better flagship? Start with the end in mind, borrowing from Stephen Covey. What is the conservation issue you want to target? What is a concern related to wildlife? So these are, any, these are just starting points to think about. Um, how can we address policy issues? And, or what would the ideal visitor experience look like for viewing this animal and coming to the park to see what this is? So again, what is it we're going to try to accomplish? What are the outcomes that we want, the flagship responses, both for visitors when they're on-site, off-site, and also for non-visitors? What might be some potential responses we want as, as a result of, of us being around? Then we decide what species are involved, and finally we figure out how to, how to develop this emotional connection so that people will get involved. So these are the traditional flagship responses, awareness, and action. We're going to figure out exactly what we want people to do. Now we're going to figure out what animals best connect to that, and then develop some interpretation and experiences around that so that people can have that emotional connection. So how do we drive the emotional connection? There's a, there's a ton of ways to do it. But if we broadly think in, in, from an interpretive standpoint and from the visitor experience standpoint, what we're seeing is that if we help visitors understand an animal's behaviors and emotions, those are strong 
topics that help people form a connection to that animal. Time and time again, those are emerging as very significant predictors of, of generating an emotional response. Highlighting their conservation status is also a new topic that's coming out demonstrating that this animal is threatened in the wild or can be saved, is being reintroduced. All of the conservation around it is another powerful message that forms an emotional connection with the visitor. We can be anthropomorphic, and then we want to provide specific behaviors that people can do as, as a follow-up then as, as the actual response. If we think about the visitor experience, this is quite a long laundry list, and I'm not going to go through all this right now. We can talk about it more later. But we want to set the stage so that people understand what's really going to happen out there in, in your site when they're viewing the animals. But what, what can we do to facilitate a better viewing experience overall for these animals, and which in turn, all of these are also shown to help facilitate a connection. How close you get to the animal, um, how many animals you see, how often you see them, are they in large groups, are they solitary, um, how well you can use the equipment you have with you, uh, and, and can you get the experience that you want from using binoculars, the telescope that you brought, um, or, or the camera. One of the big things, though, that we're also seeing, especially, and this is coming out in zoos in particular, because they are, they're so much more condensed, don't be vague about what you're trying to say. Be extremely specific and talk in extreme examples of what people can do right then, right now, on your site. Don't talk in grand biodiversity schemes. People want to know, what, you're, what about the grizzly bear, this one right here? Not even one somewhere else. If this is in Colorado, I don't care about the ones in Alaska. I want to know about this bear right here. So be specific. Don't always place things in the context of biodiversity or ecosystem services. The best thing to do is flip it and talk about how biodiversity or the ecosystem can benefit that animal. People want to know, once they've got that connection, how they can help that animal specifically. They don't care about necessarily the contribution of this animal to biodiversity. It's how does biodiversity help this animal. It's a simple switch. It'll be highly effective. And lastly, don't assume you're preaching to the choir. It's a, it's a lot of general, uh, a, a wide type of person that's coming to these places. Um, they may not be connected, they may be interested, but they may not be doing anything. So again, don't, don't assume that just because they're there and they're, they've got NPR on their, on their Subaru car radio, right, and, and they're coming with their water bottle with stickers all over it, every, right, everybody here. But, you know, don't assume that you're going to donate $25 extra to the park when you leave, even though that's exactly who you are, because you may not, right? So it, again, uh, that's, I think that's been one of the things we've been struggling with. So what's, what's driving all this? Um, again, we have traditional behavior theories, theory of planned behavior, VDN, um, and these have all been good for helping us understand why somebody does a particular behavior. And they're mostly, again, this is a gross oversimplification, so bear with me, but for the most part, they're driven by the fact that we tell people about it, we improve their knowledge, and they've got a positive attitude about it, they're going to do it. And these, these theories work for the most part. The problem is, is that they typically only deal with one type of behavior, and they, they exist in a vacuum. And there's no other context or anything else that can inform that theory. And that's, that's a bit of a problem when you're obviously standing at, in Yellowstone and you're seeing this stuff. There's other things happening besides just knowledge and attitude. So there are ways that we can begin doing it. What we're seeing is if we begin taking the visitor experience apart a little bit, and look at the physical elements, the psychosocial components of the visitor themselves, what is the interpretation event that took place, all of that is what drives this emotional connection, and that is what drives the behaviors and the awareness and action that we're seeking. So we, we can't get right to the behaviors, we've got to go through this emotional connection piece first. So if we look at it, kind of a spectrum of the behaviors we want, because again, ultimately this is based around getting people to do something. It all starts with this emotional connection. Once you've got that, because of the experience and interpretation, you can then talk about whether you, you're going to do behaviors on-site or off-site, and it's going to benefit the species or biodiversity in general. And my strong recommendation is that um, the best chance you have of getting somebody to do anything is if it's for the species, your flagship itself, and it's on-site. Once they leave, you're done. You have a very small chance of getting them to do anything. So. You want to target ex extremely specific, achievable behaviors they can do on site before they walk out the door for that one animal. That's the best shot you got. Secondly, then you can talk about doing things on site for biodiversity in general, because people are going to be more excited about the animal they're fired up about than biodiversity as a whole 
as a generic topic, but they still will do stuff. So that's your second target. And then you come down and finally look at your off-site behaviors, again, coming back to the species they're excited about, and then finally the biodiversity as a whole off-site. But you're going to see a sharp drop-off once you move to here and the rest of them. The only chance you really have of getting people engaged is when they're on site. What are some things that you can do? Um, this is a great one um, that I like. That um, it wasn't very specific, but it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Throw your money in here, and Kansas does have a dollar. <laughs> and that wasn't mine. I took that thing before I put a dollar in myself. But um, you know, so that's a very specific action you can do. But who's that helping? I don't know. It could be the coffee fund for the park interpreters, for all you know, right? Because it's just a money box. So it, it would be better if that was linked to an animal or something specific. Here's another great one. Got your cell phone off here so that they quit mining in Rwanda and, and taking away gorilla habitat to get the chemicals that they need for these phones. So that's a very simple thing to do. The next time you're there, bring your old cell phone, drop it in, save a gorilla. Right? That's easy. It's specific. It's right there. Anybody can do it. So these are the types of behaviors that we should be moving to, not, well, um, did you have a great time here? Did you like seeing? the elk, go home and buy a hybrid car. It, it, that just, it, it, it's not going to work, right? But if you like the elk that you saw here, maybe you could donate $20 for the elk themselves, and we'll put it to elk management. So those are all good things that help drive that. So what we're saying is the flagship model today has been expanded a little bit. Yeah, the visitor experience is what gets people excited about the animal, this conservation caring, the emotional connection, which will then drive the behaviors. But it's not going to drive the behaviors directly. It's always being mediated by this emotional response. So getting, just because someone's there and telling them to do something is not going to work. You need to have that emotional connection to the animal to get them excited. And lastly, if we look at how we can expand this into biodiversity, because that ultimately is the goal, flagships are supposed to deliver benefits beyond themselves to a broader array of species. And so we can begin having specific messaging. This looks better on my computer. It's a little uh, here. But having specific messaging that will demonstrate the value um, to biodiversity as a whole. We can also begin recruiting a wider array of species that demonstrate greater conservation needs and are linked to specific ecosystem threats so that we can begin addressing those. Um, and then, look, again, the behaviors creating local opportunities, in other words, on site, right then and there, but also something that could be done at home ongoing. So what's the type of behavior somebody could do at your site or for your organization right then and there at the meeting that they could also repeat indefinitely at home? You know, I, I, I don't know what that would be. But that, if, if we're thinking in those ways, we'll see greater support and greater engagement off-site where most people spend their time. So that's where I'll end for now. And um, it, basic contact there, but I think we're going to have time at the end for questions and answers. So. Turn it over to Matt. We get, or are we going to go? Or are we can do questions now. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, the, the question is: uh, flagships are not necessarily keystones or indicators, but um, they can often be confused with that or, or used synonymously, perhaps inappropriately. Um, personally, I'm not one to argue semantics if if we can get the job done. But in this situation. It's important to understand that when the, when the concept really first came out and had some academic publishing behind it, um, flagship species were never a, uh, an ecological surrogate. They were always a social indicator species, meant for conservation. Over time, it, they become synonymous with keystone and indicator somewhat inappropriately, most often, I think, in, in, in popular literature and popular sources. So, in general, I think that's fine as long as we're still getting the conservation outcome out of it. But it, it would benefit us all if we knew at least within our own organizations, if we're calling this a flagship, let's make sure we know everybody knows what the conservation outcomes are. It may also be a key statement and indicator. They're not exclusive, but they don't have to be. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, as Jeff said, he, was, uh, he put forward kind of big picture pieces concepts and definitions. And what I hope to do now is to clearly communicate a research project that involves some of those components um, that was very applied, that was uh, driven for certain management outcomes, and as, as part of an interdisciplinary team. And so I hope to kind of ground some of the elements that Jeff was talking about. And specifically, I want to talk about one component 
of using flagship species for certain outcomes. And that uh, involves a traveler's philanthropy, philanthropy program in East Africa. I want to acknowledge my, uh, my co-author here, uh, Hilary Sigalitzer, who had the uh, difficult assignment of going to East Africa and collecting the data. So I'm sure we can all feel sorry for her for having to do that. Um, so we know that parks and conservation areas and other and protected areas, including private conservancies, serve as some kind of anchors for conservation ef efforts and actions, but also uh, for biodiversity preservation. Particularly in developing nations, the, the cost of managing those protected areas effectively, uh, only a small portion of that cost is actually provided by the, by the government or uh, other entities. And so, especially in developing countries, we see this heavy reliance on other revenue sources. And this is certainly not new. In the last couple decades, we've had this growth of different traveler philanthropy programs. And traveler's philanthropy is simply the concept that people have an opportunity to give back to the places that they're traveling to and the places that they're visiting. Obviously, this is a, a critically important component for developing nations that don't necessarily have the funding structures that we see here domestically. So although this has been happening, traveler philanthropy programs globally for the last couple decades and picking up steam, we still lack some understanding about the psychological factors that are really driving people to donate either time or money in these traveler philanthropy programs. And so part of this study, part of the aim, was to begin to further understand these psychological and psychosocial factors that are driving people to contribute. And so we borrow concepts from the business world and from philanthropy, uh, but also from uh, um, uh, social conservation and park and protected area management. So I want to take you guys to East, East Africa here, to the old Pajetta uh, Conservancy. The private conservancy it used to be a ranch, cattle ranch, until 1988 and then was transferred to a different mission as a private conservancy. So they, they house three of the world's uh, remaining white rhinos and the largest uh, group of black rhinos in East Africa. And so they play a, a pretty important role. They do obviously serve visitors on game drives and, um, and other experiences, some guided and some otherwise. And at the Old Pajetta uh, Conservancy is a sanctuary, a chimpanzee sanctuary. And almost all the visitors that are in the conservancy get an opportunity to go to the chimpanzee sanctuary. But the chimpanzee sanctuary is heavily reliant on uh, a traveler's philanthropy program. And so they were interested in how can we make this more effective. Uh, there are some elements, the managers felt like there were some elements of their traveler's philanthropy program that was effective, but they didn't quite understand how it was working and how it could be more effective. And so we, we contracted with them to help them out uh, to better understand what they could do more effectively and also as a nice laboratory for us as uh, researchers to understand some of these psychosocial elements underpinning traveler philanthropy. So I'm going to uh, take you to the, the site here for a moment. So let me give you a couple shots here of the visitor experience because <coughs> Uh, we just got the information board that's actually here. There's information about each of the chimps that's coming. So, for instance, this one says, um, he is born in 1989 and he the pet. Then he was born to Jane Goodland, she came ill. He was rehabilitated here with Andrew and is now quite a loud member of the group protecting all the others. It's really sad to see how much they've all been treated. And it's amazing that they've even recovered with it. Some of them have had the most shocking backgrounds. This is Ali. Ali came from Burundi, the Jane Goodall Institute. Ali is very smart. She's about 24. She came when she was very young. She's been trying to show uh, the other chimps how to draw the feet, cut wires, get out, get out, very intelligent. She's got some things going on all the time. Mm -hmm. 
So what's important to recognize here is that the majority of communication that happens at the Sweetwater Chimpanzee Sanctuary is through non-personal interpretation, through those signs and other messaging that you saw. So what's not really representative are staff members there that are there the entire time guiding people through. Remember, this is a relatively uh, underfunded and under-resourced um, uh, sanctuary, and so they do quite well taking care of the chimpanzees, but they don't necessarily have interpretive staff there the entire time. And so the messaging content is really, really important, and that was part of uh, this investigation. So we know that messaging can certainly be effective for a number of different conservation campaigns when used appropriately and informed by certain uh, theories and models about how people process information through central and peripheral routes. And sometimes in the case of, uh, for example, in the Sweetwater Chimpanzee Sanctuary, it can be the only form of communication or the most prevalent form of communication. But we know that messaging isn't the only thing that necessarily contributes to Traveler's Philanthropy programs. We also know that trust is one central factor to that. And so uh, trust was another factor that we investigated, uh, uh, one so psychosocial factor investigated the role and its contribution to participation in a tra Traveler's Philanthropy program. So we know that it's important to donating. We have views of uh, kind of philanthropy research but it hasn't been studied in depth within, within ecotourism concept, uh, context within a private conservancy. And then as Jeff talked about earlier, this concept of conservation caring or the effective and cognitive components that can contribute to a behavior is also important within uh, traveler's philanthropy programs. And again, we know this from some previous research. What we don't know and what made this study interesting is we haven't had these combined in one model where we look at does effective messaging and engagement with that messaging contribute to higher levels of trust and higher level of conservation caring, in this case for chimpanzees, and then what, do those contribute in some form to on-site donations and to continuing future donations? And are some of these uh, direct linkages perhaps not present, such as direct, uh, such as a direct relationship between messaging and on-site donations, or do you truly have only mediating capabilities for trust and caring, and that's what is most important. So, we we uh, oh, we also wanted to we also wanted to figure out what's the synergy right between trust and caring. What's the kind of synergy between those two? Do they act in different ways? So when, when somebody's conservation caring is high, is trust as important or uh, is it less important? So we used a, 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 a sequential design, three phases. In the first phase, we did a thorough content analysis of all of that, all those messaging items at the sanctuary. So signs, brochures, and we looked specifically into those scoring them on a few different things. One, their, the effectiveness of their messaging using elements of the elaboration likelihood model for our scoring procedures. So we wanted to know, is that just generally an effective communication tool, the way it's worded, the way things are positioned? So we got an efficacy score. But then we also did a content analysis to identify what's the level of trust and what's the level of caring messages contained within that messaging item. And so all of those were aggregated together into a score for that messaging item. We used that then to drive some hypotheses for what we thought may be occurring there before we conducted our study. Phase two, we developed our instrument, a paper-based questionnaire that, was, that had validated measures. We pilot tested that in a number of different ways. And then we administered the questionnaire during peak season. And our analysis consisted of a confirmatory factor analysis to verify our measurement properties, uh, and structural regression model to test these relationships between the constructs. But then we also use the Sobel's test to uh, look at mediating effects and the strengths of, of any mediation that we found. And then remember that synergy between trust and caring? We tested that through uh, um, some interaction analysis using a, a, a method prescribed by Aiken and West. So uh, we had 244 completed questionnaires real even distribution there in gender, um, fairly well educated, fairly affluent, not necessarily surprising given the, given the location of East Africa. 
Um, so what did, what did visitors think about the messaging? Well, generally it lined, aligned well with what we thought from our content analysis. They thought it was fairly effective, that there were attributes that were effective, it was clear, concise, a central theme, and it had the potential to influence behaviors. So influence emotions and, and had opportunity to evoke sympathy. So then the question became, well, if the messaging is generally effective or visitors think that it's generally effective, how does it influence trust and caring? And we see here that uh, there is an influence. So the effective messaging that had messages of trust and caring in it influenced trust and caring. Pretty logical. But then the next question is, well, then does that trust and caring drive future donations and on-site donations? And the answer is yes for both of these. What is, uh, but it's, it, there's a, a less of an effect for the on-site donations, and I'll explain that a little more thoroughly in a couple slides. What's really interesting about this is that trust and conservation caring, although contribute to somebody's willingness to donate on-site, there's, there's almost, um, there's about 95% here of the reason people are donating is not explained by trust and conservation caring. So there's other elements at play here, and trust and caring are just one of those. And we can see here also the connection between trust and caring. There is a significant connection here in relationship, and that gives, gives us some foundation to further test what that interaction looks like. Um, is there a differential effect of each of these constructs based on the level of well, what we can say about the mediation results through our Sobel test is that messaging alone is not going to produce necessarily donation behavior. It's got to be messaging, in this case, that drives towards this emotional connection to the animal, conservation caring, and trust in the organization, that there has to be some trust in the organization. It's not enough just to message alone. The messaging, at least in this case, needs to drive towards those two constructs. From that interaction effect and test of interaction, we, we can see here that caring and trust are definitely synergistic when they're combined in a model together. And that's important because we know that the on-site donation behavior was really driven um, when, when trust was high and caring was high. So we know that there's some kind of connection going on there. So we also were interested in con constraints and influences particularly constraints and influences that managers could address. And we see the two highlighted here in orange, lack of donation information was a contributing factor to why people didn't donate. That can be resolved by the sanctuary, and, and they have uh, not only put things online to communicate that, but they've improved some messaging there on site, and no cash on hand. So at that time of the study, a couple of years ago, the way to donate on site was only by cash, right? And there may be some limits to people, either their ability, because they don't have the cash in the pocket, or their willingness to donate their, their last 10 shillings or whatever it is uh, to a, a traveler's philanthropy program. So what are some recommendations that came out of this? And, and we, you know, a large purpose of the project here was to provide very focused and tailored recommendations for the sanctuary. But we, I, I want to broaden some of these recommendations that can be kind of captured by uh, many agencies in different settings. So educate visitors about donation, about the donation program before the ask. So that should be done early and often before you ask for donations. Locate donation opportunities. So that could be uh, opportunities um, such as uh, adopting a chip or buying a chip lunch, whatever, whatever that specific action could be, in places where visitors naturally congregate, not in traffic pattern corridors. Provide easy options. So that's got two parts, right? Something that's easy and something that, that has options. So allow people to have choice and ownership over their donation such as adopting a very specific chip with a very specific name, very specific behavior that they've had a connection to, or buy a chip, chimp lunch once a month for the next year. But a very specific action item that people can contribute to. Um, those, uh, the information about donation programs and opportunities needs to be simple. So if it's an exhibit, less than 50 words. Signs, less than 25 words. 
And if we know trust is important and it can be influenced by messaging, then what should we do about that? We'll communicate exactly how donations will be used. And, it, and, it, and so it needs to be specific. It can't just be that this will help improve the sanctuary. Way too vague. Well, how is that money going to actually be spent? How will it be used? And uh, use previously examples of previously donated funds to identify how those funds have been used in the past. And you can do that by displaying pictures or videos about how those funds have been used so it becomes more tangible. Um, and we know that those elements can increase trust. So caring. So if caring is a driver of donations. It can be influenced by messaging. Uh, vivid stories that evoke emotions and capture attention are important here in, in these messaging items. Emphasize the program and donation benefits that evoke emotion. And again, make those stories personalized and relevant to that visiting audience. And this is where knowing thy audience becomes pretty important. Um, knowing, knowing who the audience is so those stories can connect to that demographic group and their expectations and experiences. So that's it. I think we're, we're going to have time at the end for questions for everybody, but I'm happy to take any clarifying questions here. Sure. So uh, the question is, is how was the organization previously um, messaging to encourage trust? in their organization and what kind of indicators or measures were used for trust. So, okay, so the, the first one is is that um, they, uh, one of the reasons that, especially in this model, trust was less effective than caring is it was less present in their messaging. And so they were uh, talking about the history of the organization, right, how many chimpanzees they've, they've uh, um, uh, been able to save and help over time. So some of those kind of so some of those kind of elements. What they weren't necessarily communicating is so those are past successes. They weren't communicating necessarily partners that they had uh, in East Africa, right? Which then brings some legitimacy to the organization. So those are some recommendations we had that there's other people that believe in this organization. So there's kind of this normative effect from that, and that uh, what they're doing present day initiatives. Um, and that only that not only connects with chimpanzees, but also support of the local community. So all of that is, are things that they're beginning to add to their messaging. If you go to their website, you'll see some of that material on there too. So the the indicators and measures we use for trust are multidimensional. So I just showed the larger second order construct here of trust, but the first dimension con constructs or first order dimensions were things like performance of the organization and these communication elements. And those are all measured by multiple items on a nine-point Likert scale. And so, um, uh, and there is a, a, other analyses that could be had to look at how those dimensions specifically influence donation behavior and other stronger elements within those dimensions. And uh, if you want the scale, I can send you the scale or send you the article and you can go through it. So the question is, is basically where did, where did the money go, right? So did it, did it go to have this visitor experience in this quasi-zoo setting, or were there, as Jeff mentioned earlier, kind of larger conservation initiatives that were funded by that? And the answer is both, and I don't know the particular percents or numbers on, on either one. So what's interesting about, uh, about this is that chimpanzees are, Kenya is not their home range, right? So Central Africa and, and Western Africa. And so these are all rescued chimpanzees uh, from not only poaching and uh, in illegal trade, but habitat loss. And so they're rescued from some of those communities. And I know some of their, their, the portion of their funds goes to try to bolster their habitat and decrease poaching and things in that area. I don't know what the percentages are. Though. OK, ready? So people who are going to this, maybe they've established this relationship well before ever getting there. Yeah. So one, there could be a predisposition predis effect, right? Um, the the light, for your first question, later, right? It's the later. They this was part of a larger East African experience, and certainly it wasn't the destination to end up at chimpan the chimpanzee sanctuary. Um, but the other thing that we saw, so we did coupled with this, it was a mixed method study, so we had. 30 hours of interviews and some other stuff that we were doing. And coupled with that, one of the, the highlights was donation fatigue, right? So this was 
a, a stop along their visit, and they've already been asked by other travelers' philanthropy programs in East Africa to donate money. And so by the time they got here, they have already donated to other places, other causes, and some, you know, and that all kind of wrapped up into this bigger theme of donation fatigue. And our recommendation, I'm not sure that this was fully accepted or implemented, was that uh, that, that requires some kind of regional-wide communication and regional-wide initiatives to make sure that donation fatigue isn't happening. And, and I think that was part of the case of the chimpanzee sanctuary. So it, you know, it requires some communication and collaboration. How long ago did you know the order in which they came to this park versus others and what they donated to and was that accepted? Yeah, so we know, the, the question is, do we know uh, how many other parks or uh, previous visits to other sanctuaries or other things in the, in the, um, uh, happened in this trip? Um, what we know is length of stay prior length of stay in the country or length of visit in the country prior to being at uh, the sanctuary. We don't know if how many parks they went to, how many sanctuaries, how many game drives. We don't know that. But so we, we could test it, but it's going to be um, uh, there's going to be you know it's not going to be a real strong um, uh, sound relationship just because we don't know number of parks. We can assume if they've been in East Africa, they've been engaged in wildlife tours, but it's going to be based on that assumption. OK, I'm going to turn it over to, to Ryan Sharp here. And OK, so I'm going to, I'm going to be uh, relatively brief so we can engage in more of a conversation. Um, this is not wildlife, but it's my daughter, and it's pretty close to wildlife. So, um, but we, we came across that sign in, in Florida, and you know I think it summed up kind of partly of what, what we're what we're talking about today. But what I want to talk about really is um, looking at management actions and what could make them successful, right? And of course, this will not be all encompassing. I'm not going to cover every single management option that that is available. I'm going to use a couple of case studies to, to, to try to drive the point home. But um, in some of these you've already seen, right? Jeff talked about some of these things, and um, Matt talked about some of these things as well. But if people are coming to parks or protected areas, and our goal is to conserve these areas and to have them go home and exhibit these behaviors through donations or whatever the case may be, we have to include them. Right? We have to include them in that process. So that's kind of intuitive. We kind of know that already. Um, that consistent message, too, I, I think this is where, where a lot of management actions break down. We, we, we want to inundate the, the public with, with messages, right? because we want them to get this. We want them to understand. We want to, you know, do we put it on Facebook? Do we put it on Twitter? Do we put it on all these different avenues, right? And, and then what type of, is, is it the same message every time? Probably not, right? Because especially like if we put it on a Twitter or something like that, you're, you're constrained by the number of characters. But having some sort of consistent message is the best, one of the best ways to um, achieve some of these outcomes that we're talking about. And, you know, in, in just my experience with working in some of the parks, they're always well-intentioned, but they tend to put forth mixed messages, right? because it's not intentional. Um, and Jeff talked a lot about being intentional, too. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the, so this is, this is more kind of muddy area, right? The post posted it, and we have next to no control over this, right? But we can still try to figure out ways to, to, to look into this, right? So even if we, you know, we can't, we can't the park, the park managers or the interpreters, we can't get in the, in the visitors' cars and go home with them. I mean, we could, um, but I don't know if they would like that. Uh, it depends on the individual, I guess. But uh, we're not going to go home with them and stand, uh, sit at the dinner table and, and keep pounding the message into, into their heads, right? Because that's a lot of the things with the interpretive messages when it comes to the conservation of wildlife is it has to be a repeated, consistent message, right? So if I go to a park and I hear somebody tell me how important uh, bison are or bears are or whatever the case may be, if I hear that once, it's not going to be effective, right? If I go to only one park a year or one protected area a year, I hear that message once, I go home, 
I eat my popcorn, I go to bed, right? It's, it's, it's not going to be effective. So trying to find ways, you know, through that consistent message to maintain that relationship with the visitors in some way after they get home, right? Because we want these things to go home with them. We don't want them to just, everybody's happy at the park, right? How many satisfaction surveys are done at the end of your park visit? What are they going to say? It was fun, right? I had time. I was satisfied. There's other things that contribute to that, right? It's like kind of like the Griswold effect. I'm going to go to Wally World. I'm going to have a good time whether we like it or not, right? Um, so it, it, asking people those questions on site, we're going to get somewhat predictable answers. So finding ways to, to continue that message and take it uh, so they take it home with them. And, and that's, that's really what this, that sums it up, right? So maintaining the visitor's enthusiasm. So everybody's really excited. They're at the park. They're at the particular protected area, whatever the case may be. How can we maintain that enthusiasm? So like I said, I'm going to be relatively short here. Um, I want to talk about a couple examples of uh, management scenarios, right? So it's uh, conservation related, but maybe not conservation specific in these particular examples, but they're, they're definitely relatable to what we've been talking about. So black bears, Big South Fork, anybody know what that is by any chance? Find your park, right? Um, it's in uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. It's a national recreation area. It's a new park. Um, it was designated in the 80s. Um, anyway, it has the, the Big South Fork River goes through the Wadden Creek River. It's a, it's a very cool place. And, and black bears were not, they were extirpated from the area, you know, in the early um, 1900s. So they reintroduced bears. So now we have this, this, this uh, beautiful animal that's coming back in on its own, as well as the introduced, introduced uh, population. But they're starting to move in from eastern Tennessee. They're starting to move in from other areas as well. So we have this population of black bears in a place that traditionally, in the last 100 years anyway, has not had them. For the people on the phone, they can't see me doing any of this stuff, right? Um, I was just doing air quotes, by the way. Um, so they wanted to know. So this was actually a great example, too, because it was pro proactive. One of, the, one of the biggest criticisms of park managers and it's not their fault, it's the, it's the result of the way things are, is that they're too reactive, right? But how do we know these things until they're happening, right? Well, usually we need things done right now because we have something going on, there's an issue, there's other things going on. But this is a proactive thing, right? So the bears are not, visitors see them once in a while, but not really all that much. Um, and in terms of other animals in this park that could potentially be like a flagship, the black bear is probably going to be one of the main ones. They have some elk moving into the area too. Um, that were introduced to Eastern Kentucky. But the, the, the main point of this was looking at ways to proactively manage black bears, because it's going to be, they're going to have to manage them at some point. Any park or protected area that has black bears, they have to be managed at some point, right? Because they start, and it's usually related to people. Bears and animal management is usually more of a people management issue than it is a, a wildlife management issue. People leave garbage around. Um, you know, people stop on the side of the road, all that kind of good stuff. So what are they willing to tolerate? What are visitors willing to tolerate? For an animal that they love, we know people love black bears. People go to parks all over the country to see them, right? They're definitely, uh, maybe not specifically in parks, a flagship species for all parks, but people go to see black bears when they go to a Yellowstone or something like that, or Smoky Mountains, right? They, they, they want to see black bears. So what they wanted to know is, okay, so, the bear population increases. This is a recreation area, right? So they allow hunting in the park. So it's kind of a unique thing, too. So the options were, do you want to, can we maintain the population through hunting? Can we maintain the population through relocation? Can we maintain the population through um, uh, hazing? Uh, can we maintain the population through visitor use management in terms of hopefully people would put stuff in the garbage, we get bear-proof garbage cans, all that stuff. Or the most extreme example is with continued problem bears, do we, do we euthanize them, right? So you might guess that euthanization was not a popular choice, right? Um, nobody was really interested in that. However, one of the variables was, uh, did you receive information about black bears in the park during your stay? Half the people, so the sample was about 500 people. Half the people, it was, it was unbelievable. 250 did, 250 didn't didn't do that on purpose, it just happened, which was great. Um, 
those that received information about black bears during their stay, they could either be through some sort of talk or through some sort of flyer, their signs up saying black bears be aware kind of stuff. Those that received that information were more willing, still not really all that willing, but more willing to accept bigger measures like euthanasia, right? So having that consistent messaging through the park for, in this example gave people, they understood, right? So yeah, we don't want to do that, but we can do that if we need to, um, and we understand why. And another interesting thing about this one too is that they have this pop, they have this train that goes big South Fork train. Um, it's kind of cool, right? Some people like to go on trains, and uh, the people that ride those trains are different from the people who camp, right? So the people that ride the trains are casual visitors from maybe Chattanooga or um, um, Knoxville, whereas the, the campers are more, for lack of a better term, more how, uh, hardcore outdoor type folks, right? So the people that rode the train. Uh, the people that rode the train were less likely to support things like hunting, um, or pretty much all the management options across the board, which makes sense in a lot of ways, right? The people that are camping, uh, they're more local. Hunting is a big thing in that area, so it's more. It makes more sense that uh, these bears. But it's not a perfect world situation, right? Um, obviously, there's no such thing in parks. So that's one. That's one example. The second one is a little more dicey, right? So I might ask more questions here than I actually talk into answers, but. Uh, so these are these are pretty, right? Pretty horses. Everybody likes horses. Um, this is uh, Cumberland Island National Seashore, which is in South Georgia on the border of Georgia and Florida, probably about an hour away from Jacksonville, just to give you some perspective. These, uh, the ruins there that you see, that's the Dungeness ruins. So the, the the Carnegie family in the late 1800s, early 1900s owned this island. There was a retreat that they went to. Uh, it burned down in 1950. That's the but that's that's the ruins that you see. But that horse picture right there with a the horse in front of the ruins, that's why people go there. So the horse is the is definitely, maybe not intentionally, but is the flagship species for this park. Right? Depending on what park you're in, horses are defined differently. So this is this is a whole different conundrum, right? So what was the thing that you said about horses as flagships? What was it? Yeah. Yeah, sinking an unintended flagship, right? These are these are unmanaged at this particular park. They're not. There's there's no uh, veterinary care. There's no uh, vaccinations and or, um, no vaccinations. No uh, contraception of any kind to control the population. Um, so they're they're completely wild horses, but they're essentially polo ponies that were released by the Carnegies in the 1900s, right? But people go there to see them, right? So what do you do? With an animal like this that everybody goes to see because they're beautiful and we have a personal relationship as humans with horses, right? What do we do with this with this animal that is potentially impacting native species, right? So American oyster catchers um, are are on this beach and they're a protected species. They lay their eggs right here. They just dig a little tiny hole in the sand. They lay an egg right there. So every time that the horses go out on the dunes, they step on one of those eggs, right? Is that a problem? So, um, but some of the work that's the one of some of the work that I did there, you know, people were the question was, do you want to get rid of the horses, and, and what do you think they said, right? No, of course not. I had some very interesting comments on some of the surveys that I did there. Um, people perceived me as not liking horses, all these kinds of good things. Um, some stuff I can't repeat here. Uh, but these are wilds, right? So these are, and this is one of my favorite pictures. This was taken just a couple months ago. I took some students. Uh, to Cumberland Islands, and we were all standing. I had ten students. We were all standing there watching this woman try to feed that foal. Right? Did anything happen? No. Uh, but I like to put this picture up here because it's very unflattering for that woman, even though because uh, she shouldn't have been doing that. That's very poor visitor behavior. Um, but that's how people treat them because they're horses. Right? Is somebody going to do that to a bear? A dumb person, yes, but but they're but they're but they're more, but they're much more likely to go up to a horse, right? Because they they think it's you know I can ride it, I can touch it, I pet it, I'm going to give it apples. It's beautiful. So in terms of conservation type type thing, the horse gets people there. It gets people talking about conservation. It gets people talking about animals. So maybe that's a good thing. I I don't know. Um, 
I'm sure you have opinions on this, but this is, and there's cases like this in other parks too with horses or, or maybe species that aren't supposed to be there, right? They're out of place. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, Larry, um, I'm incorporating the audience now. I'm putting you on the spot too. But uh, at Everglades, which Larry came from recently, the snakes, so they got these pythons, right, which, you know, if, if you put this horse and the python next to each other, most people are going to be horrified by the python that loves the horse, even though the horse will probably do more damage to you if you get near it, right? But the pythons, people are, they're having hunts for the pythons, right, which are bringing people to the park, which gives opportunities to talk about conservation and interpretation, right? Is that a good thing? <laughs> yeah, sure. So these unintended species that people end up going to see, how does that fit into this conservation idea that we've been talking about, right? Um, again, I'm asking more questions than I'm, than I'm answering, but that's kind of the point here is I want people to think about how animals like this fit into the larger scheme of this conservation idea. And that's a fake elk, but it's still wildlife. I'm sorry. I, 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 I put kids in my presentation, so it makes me feel less guilty about being in the way. So, um, and that's it. So, questions? If there are none for me. I guess it's time for everybody, right? Yes. So one one thing that came up um, at at the end of Matt's presentation was was with the um, was how conservation caring, um, which is which is a scale that we've been developing um, to, to to measure the emotional connection people have. So remember what was the third point about flagship species that I said you had to remember? The emotional connection drives everything, right? And generally, what we're talking about with that emotional connection is empathy. Um, most of the literature supports the fact that empathy is the most productive emotional response to measure for helping behaviors as associated with pro-environmental and pro-conservation behaviors. One of the things that, that arises when you go to a situation like a, like a wildlife rehabilitation sanctuary where many of these animals will never be reintroduced into the wild. And the conservation messaging may be, and, and again, I'm not, I, I, I can't speak directly to what the study uh, did, but um, the messaging there may not necessarily be completely linked to conservation of chimps as opposed to managing the chimps that are brought in there, which is a noble and valid purpose. But that can perhaps be more, better interpreted as sympathy. Um, which again may be an explanation as to why we're seeing some of the changes in behavior. So it also helps us to understand what it is that we're trying trying to do. And uh, again, I, I would recommend empathy being what you're trying to to elicit as opposed to sympathy behaviors, um, because empathetic behaviors are are ones that you can do something about. Sympathy is you you've given up hope, um, and and you're not inclined to help. You just walk away feeling bad. Um, and that elicits then the whole ecophobia thing and things like that. So but one one little way of, of nuancing that that emotional response. Yes. Uh, so, so the question is: Is conservation caring specific to a species? It, it, um, yes and no. So the the way the scale is developed is um, we ask the, the we ask the visitor, what animal did you feel the strongest connection to during your visit today? And based on that animal, please answer these eight questions. And so it's species specific that way, but in, in a broader sense, when we integrate it into structural equation modeling, it becomes uh, generalizable to any species present. We have, we have used it specific to one species, right? So an example would be the chimps, and another example would be grizzly bears in Denali. So we did a study there uh, doing similar modeling of, of about a year ago, two years ago. And uh, there we asked specifically about grizzly bears. Um, and and we don't we haven't quite worked through everything in that model yet. But one of the interesting things we looked at kind of two different DVs in that study, and so it wasn't just philanthropy. There were a number of different conservation action items people could select from, and that was kind of the strength of their um, uh, conservation action at the end. But we asked about that strength on site for the grizzly bears at Denali, and then we asked about grizzly bears in general as a species. So all grizzly bears outside of you know, including Denali, and uh, but there it was focused just on one species. 
and, and to that, there, there was a difference. Um, be, people were more concerned and more inclined to do a certain set of behaviors for the, the Denali grizzly bears compared to a broad, generic grizzly bear population. Um, so we are seeing some differences, which again gets to that on-site specific behavior linked to the species. Um, and, and then you can broaden it perhaps later, but don't, um, don't give people the opportunity to misinterpret what you're saying. Be specific and give them that opportunity. And, and to that point, too, there's um, uh, a paper coming out in, in Journal of Sustainable Tourism where we looked at the big five in Africa and uh, an additional eight species. And we created these wildlife cohorts. And basically, there was no difference between them um, in terms of the, the level of connection people felt and the behaviors they were willing to do. So in, in, a, in a broad effort, East African safari setting, it doesn't matter what animal the people are connecting to. They're having that emotional connection, and they're just as likely to do something for a hyena as they are for an elephant. So uh, how does on-site and off-site messaging differ? Um, I don't know. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, the, the main thing is that what the, the, the key to that um, point is you need to provide an opportunity at your facility for somebody to do something and not think they're going to go home and turn in the card or send a check or sign up for your website listserv email blast or anything like that. Once they're gone, they're gone and they've forgotten about it. Um, the only thing you get, you get in the car with the kids, and all of a sudden, you're, where are we eating? Where are we going to go? I'm hungry, right? and you're not remembering. Oh yeah, we're supposed to um, go home and go to this website and take this survey, and then donate a ten dollar gift card back. You know, forget it. So that that's really more of the point, and that's and that's just a matter of relying on your your crack interpretation staff to develop some good messaging behind that. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it over to Matt and Ryan here. It's not necessarily the most. It, it, it's not the most effective. It's it's the most um, successful opportunity that you'll have. So, so you'll have the most success of getting people to engage in the behavior by letting them do it right then and there before they go home. Um, there may be more effective ways long term that, again, with consistent messaging and repeated messaging that will do that. But if you're hoping to get the response from a certain behavior, that's your best chance of doing it. But long term effectiveness is, is, is a different issue. Yeah. You know, my sense is we're probably talking about two different populations in some ways, right? So we're, we're talking about a population that's already engaged with a protected area. They're there. Um, it sounds like yours is your population you're working with might be more um, aligned with kind of relevancy campaigns and trying to get uh, folks involved. But, you know, the, the, um, you know, the whole concept of, of backyard wildlife and that some of these folks that aren't coming to a refuge already have a connection with some animals, perhaps in their own backyard. And that is certainly one way to start that conversation. And I think it just goes back to that emotional connection to a species, even if it's not the species that's at the refuge. Um, and, and even as Ryan talked about, it may be an invasive species. But there's some connection there. And that gets that, that um, emotion as the wellspring of action has you know, some kind of basis to then begin that conversation to make whatever's happening at the refuge and management goals and species uh, potentially link and be more relevant. And uh, I, I think too, it's a fantastic question. I, I don't know if we know. I maybe I'm, I'm certainly not the know-all, everything of all things. That makes any sense. But um, apparently, clearly. Uh, but do we know? that connection, do you have to hold the animal? Do you have to see the animal? Do you have to, do you have to be there, right? Um, can, you, can you see uh, a dead animal in a zoo and have the same conservation outcomes, right? Can you, can you or not a zoo, sorry, a museum, see dead animals at a zoo? Because uh, <laughs> zoo, you, uh, <laughs> but like at a museum compared to, let's, let's say, like a zoo, right? And then maybe in in Swiss or a park, are those outcomes? We might think that they are, but I don't know if we necessarily know that. Right? That that's a great question. To follow on this, I was intrigued by the model because there's just been climate change. A lot of that messaging is flipped around, which is trust drives the message that we heard, as opposed to the message drives trust. 
And I, I, I don't think you can do it with your data here, but it is an issue which is a trusted provider of information, whether it's an agency or a neighbor, gets a much more effective message across than does just general messaging. And I don't know if you guys have ever looked at I know the climate he did, the media climate change stuff is all about trusted deliverer before you know what the message is. Yeah, so is it a is it a uh, in the eyes of the receiver of the message is the deliver is the person delivering the message a reputable source, a, a reasonable expert, and those things. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, you know, if, I think just for the context of the sanctuary, um, I, I imagine because most of the visitors probably have had very little to ever any interaction with chimps that they see the sanctuary as some having some kind of expertise because it's so novel and foreign. Um, but I know I. I uh, yeah, I, I agree with you that that is kind of prevailing wisdom, especially in climate change communication. You're exactly right that whoever's delivering the message, it really matters. Yeah. Please. Yes, sir. Follow up with that of the of the ones that got the information and were more prone to support other ways to manage the bird. What percentage of those were train riders and other? Because I know you said the train riders were less likely to support. Alternative method. Yeah, the train. Educate train riders. Were they willing to? I, I don't know. The train riders didn't get a whole lot of education because it was through a, a concessioner, so it was not. There wasn't an interpreter on the train. Uh, they probably didn't have the exposure to the messages in terms of be bear aware because they were more. They were on the train. They rode the train. They got off the train, looked at some stuff, got back on the train, went home. Right. Um, so I don't really know for sure, but they they certainly were exposed to less messaging. Okay, so we have one question from the folks online. From this is coming from Bill Stiver. It says, "Are you not concerned about how anthropomorphism and creating emotional connections can distort views of what wildlife really is, which then has implications for wildlife management?" Um, it, yes and uh, no. In, in is, is simply speaking, uh, obviously we want to. Um, use the information and the knowledge that we have of the, of the ecology and the natural history of the animal to present a uh, truthful and scientifically accurate portrayal of what the animal does. Anthropomorphizing a bison um, can help us explain to visitors behaviors, perceived emotional states of the animal, um, life cycles and, and natural history elements of the animal. But we want to make sure that we do it in such a way that we don't portray the animal as being the bison you want to go up and take the selfie with. Right? So there's ways of anthropomorphizing the animal to demonstrate the specific elements of what's happening in your interpretive message that are scientifically accurate without uh, causing or, or without uh, it, in accidentally engendering the issues that can lead to, to um, uh, negative visitor interactions. Uh, now, that sounds wonderful and theoretically possible. The reality is it, it, it is very difficult to do. But what we're seeing is, is, in particular, with animals that are less violent and aggressive or deadly, um, and, and in particular, ones that are difficult to see or that are a high conservation risk but are, are never going to be seen by the public, is where anthropomorphism can help people identify with that animal and form some connections, in particular in the way we present their, uh, their ecological niche, basically. And so if we, can, if we can do that in a way that's a little softer um, and that, that can play up some of the features, um, you know, large forward-facing eyes, more neonatal features of the face um, as anthropomorphic characters and yet still be true to what the animal does, those are some ways that we're, that we're exploring um, uh, using that as an interpretive tool. And, and I, I'm not the expert on, on this, but one of the uh, recommendations that we made to, in one of the, study, the studies in uh, Denali was around an interpretation, basically. And it had to do with sows and cubs. And it had to do with, with talking about family connections, so that kind of these, some of these universal themes of interpretation that a lot of us, even um, regardless of uh, whatever funny families and dysfunctions we have within our family units. Uh, there is you know, some level of connection and love, or there has been at certain times. And so one of the recommendations was, was around talking about sows and cubs, because that was the, the family unit 
that people observed and then relating it in some way to their own family through some of these universal themes. And so it's, it's probably a little less direct than what Jeff's talking about, but it does, it's all about helping to facilitate that emotional connection and making sure that that message is relevant um, so that people can understand a sow and cubs as a family unit and relate it to their own family unit, even though the, um, obviously the, the dynamics are quite, and relationships are quite different. That was a great example. I think that helps a lot. So I think we are just about out of time. And I wanted to thank our speakers for coming and for all of you for joining in on a great conversation. And hopefully you'll join us all next time. We have not yet solidified the date for our next seminar, but hopefully that should be coming up soon. So thanks again to everyone. Round of applause. And thanks. <laughs>